It's been such a long day, you guys. I really apologize. It's a super low-key night. It's just us who are still here for spring break, so let's just join worship together. Your love is greater, your love is strong. 
you, God. I thank you for tonight and for the songs that we've been able to sing. And, um, just how much your word and your uh, life has prepared us to be alive for you and to be sent on a mission for glorifying your name. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Awesome. I don't think it's on. Yeah, neither is mine. I can, okay, cool. I don't know if it's working, but we have loud voices. So, hi guys, I'm Olivia, if you don't know me. And I'm Abby, I'm her twin. I'm here half the time when she's not, in case you didn't know. <laughs> okay, um, just kidding, I'm only here one time. Maybe more in the future. Um, anyway, uh, we're very glad you're here. Thanks for making it out. I know it's a small group tonight, but we're really glad that you guys could make it. Hope you're having an awesome spring break. Um, tonight for a get to know you game, um, if you guys don't know people around you or you see people that you don't know as well as you think you could or should, then that's what we're gonna be aiming for. It's not like our regular big group. So we're gonna be doing a game that we have done previously, but we both think is a super awesome game. It's called? It's called story time. Okay, um, so what you do is <laughs> um, you tell one exciting thing, fun thing, something that stood out from your week um, in a story, and then you have to string it together with your three or four other people in your group to make it a storyline. So for example, I went to the hospital this week, got licensed to be a nurse assistant and took a test and Olivia and I went on a hike and got all muddy because it had just rained with my other sisters. So oh. once upon a time, <laughs> <laughs> once upon a time, we were walking, trudging through the mud on our way to the hospital, showed up to take this license exam, all muddy, a disgrace. It was terrible. They almost turned us away because the mud on our scrubs was to our knees. Not allowed. But instead, we took the exam, we passed, and we got licensed. Gonna work in the hospital. Woohoo! Woohoo! Okay. Yes. All Exciting right. things. Okay, now it's your turn. So stand up, find three, a group of three or four people, and tell a story. Also, at the end, we're going to ask you to share an exciting story. So, so the best people are going to share their stories. Make it dramatic. Alright guys, about one more minute. Alright. 
Hey guys, I hope you came up with a cool story. Does any group want to share the story they came up with? Who has the best? Who was, who was great at stringing them together? Are you guys good? All right, does anybody? Yeah, okay. Ooh, okay, here we go. All right, so my man Luke here built some shelves for the shelf building competition we did, uh, and he benched them. They had Bibles on them, and we went from first place in this competition to dead last. Okay. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. Hello. Um, so for our story, it's a little bit sad, but anyways, Amy's goat Eloise was eaten by a mountain lion, and so... In order to commemorate Eloise, everybody took a bike ride on the Bob Jones out to the ocean, did a paddle out to commemorate her, and drank a little bit of wine and poured it out in remembrance of her. All right, does one more group want to share their story? No one? Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so we were, um, we picked up crocheting again, and we were crocheting little hats at a football game, um, but then we got a call that there was a chicken running around. It was a really long call, too, like for hours, yeah. but we, we just had to grab the chicken while we were on the phone and crocheting at the same time, and then it started to rain. So just on top of all that, yeah, it was a fun day. Nice. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, guys. You can find your seats. And now we have a couple quick announcements. Number one announcement is about you. Thank you for being here. I know lots of you have spring break. It's really great to see your faces, though. Um, and number two, exciting. Which really oh. should be number one because it's more exciting. Than more exciting than exciting? you being here? Yeah. I disagree. Because, because you can meet people who aren't here with you. Okay. So number two. Virtual game night, gonna be a ton of fun, gonna play games like Jackbox! I don't know what that is, but <laughs> <laughs> I hope you do! <laughs> um, and then there might be trivia, there's gonna be a bunch of stuff, but how are you gonna find out about it? How? You're, you're asking yourself. Yes, because we know you're all gonna be there. Inbox, or check you, your emails. Yes. Oh, I gave it away. That's okay. Check yes. your emails, it's gonna be in there, all the codes, where you're gonna go. All that stuff, so watch out. Yes, um, I think that's it. Check your inbox for the code. Be at the virtual game night because it's gonna be fun and I'm going to learn what Jackbox is. I hope you do too. Awesome, thank you guys. And John is preaching for us tonight. So please welcome him. Yeah, here we go. What's up guys? Welcome, yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, Jackbox is a bunch of different types of games on one program you can play with your friends. So um, it's not about Jackbox tonight. We're actually in our John 17 series, if you guys want to turn there. Um, we've been going over the high priestly prayer. Christ is praying um, before his crucifixion. He's with the disciples, and he's talking about the supernatural connections we have to Christ. And it's all these phrases that are like, even as or just as, as, and he's comparing something about him or his connection to the Father with us and it's his people. So it's um, been a really cool series. Tonight we're going to be uh, going over um, sent, even as Jesus is sent. And we're looking at verse 18. Um, so we're going to be reading John 17, 14 through 21, just to start here. Um, all right. Um, verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, 
that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So this is the word of the Lord. And we're looking at verse 18 tonight. If you guys caught it, it was, um, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So you is the Father sending Jesus into the world. So as the Father sent Christ into the world, so Jesus is sending his disciples into the world. And you might wonder how that applies to us, but in verse 20, we read that, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So through the generations, through the word of the disciples of Jesus, we've come to believe and have faith in Jesus Christ. So that's why it also applies to us today is he's sending his disciples out, but he's saying, but I'm also asking about all the people in the future who will believe through their word. So Jesus is also asking for us and telling us that we are sent into the world in the same way that Jesus is sent into the world by the Father. So that brings us to what does it mean to be sent? We are going to be sent in the same way Jesus is, but it means that he has a mission for us. That's what the word mission means. It means to be sent or to send for some assignment or purpose. And Jesus has a purpose for us. He has a mission for us. And God created humans to be missional and purpose-driven creatures. We are naturally missional, and Jesus has this plan for us that we're going to be sent like he is, and that's in our nature even that we want to fulfill that. Even when we're in rebellion of God, atheists or anyone in the world loves stories about people who deny and sacrifice themselves for a greater cause, people that are on missions. That's why we love books and movies and video games. Think about it, in video games, you have a bunch of missions, right? And in books, people are on a quest and they're trying to find some greater cause or complete some purpose and they end up having to sacrifice something in their lives or even their lives and deny themselves in some way to complete those goals. So that's why we love those stories is because ultimately that's God's story for humanity as he sent Christ on this mission to the world to deny himself and sacrifice himself for our sake for the greater cause of saving humanity and that is the ultimate story and that is why we love it and that is why all of our movies and all of the storytelling that humans do revolves around something like that in that storyline arc in all of our movies and um, Tim Keller mentioned something like this and he said even children understand these aspirations this like missional purpose to life. And when kids are talking about what they're ch- like, what they want to be when they grow up, what their occupation is going to be, they don't say they want to work in an office or something, right? They want to be a firefighter or a policeman or a doctor, and they want to give something of themselves so that they can serve the community or serve a greater cause or a purpose somehow. So even kids are getting this, um, unbelievers are getting this. It's just naturally ingrained in humans. And this passage that we just read tells us about how God's people has a mission, and our mission is the same as Christ's mission. So um, that's our first point tonight, is that we're sent on the same mission as Jesus Christ, and that is what we're doing. That's why we're on earth, but we have to ask the question, in what way was Jesus sent, and what was his mission? Because that's really important. If that's our mission, we need to know what it is. So simply put in one sentence, Jesus was sent into the world to bring people to God. That's really as simple as you can put it, and that is our mission in this world. We're sent into the world to bring people to God. The reason we are on earth is to bring people to God. And Jesus is going into the world, telling people about God so that they can know him. And we read in verse 3, or we didn't read it, but if you read verse 3 with me of chapter 17, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, We're trying to tell people about God so they can know God, so they can know about him and know him so they can have eternal life. That's that's the mission. That's how we bring people to God. So Jesus, again, is this perfect missional story about sacrifice and greater purpose. He sacrificed himself for the sins of the world, even though the world rejected and hated him. He's our perfect and our beautiful savior, and we are on the same mission as him. We're trying to follow him in that. He, his love and mercy is beyond all understanding. And it's out of this love that we go on missions for Jesus. This is the reason we go on missions. It's because he loved us and he gives us that love. That love's in us and we go out to tell people about the grace, to tell people about God. 
If we love people, we're going out and we're telling them about the greatest thing in the universe that we've experienced for ourselves, God. So we want to go tell people about that grace, and Jesus gives us some specific ways that he tells us how he was sent into the world in this chapter. So in verse 4, if you guys want to look there with me, 17.4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So that's the first way Jesus was sent into the world. This is the first way we can know what our mission's like is God gave Jesus work to do, and he glorified God by accomplishing that work. So we have work to do. That's part of our mission. We have something to do, and we're going to glorify God through it. And if you look at verse 6 with me, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. So he's manifesting God's name. That means he's sharing what he knows about God, and that's what we need to do. We need to share what we know about God so that when people think of his name, they think of Christ's glory. We want to glorify him on earth, and that's our work, is letting people know about God, glorifying him, speaking of him in glorious terms. We don't just want to be like, oh yeah, God, like that's like part of my life. We want to tell him how that's our whole world, and that's what our lives revolve around, so that people see Christ as glorious when we share the gospel with them. So Jesus, in verse 4, verse 6, tells us that he's basically here to manifest God's name and let people know about God so that they can know him and have eternal life. So in, in the other Gospels, he also mentions ways that he was sent into the world, like what his purpose here on earth. And in Matthew 20, 28, he says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we look there that Jesus came to serve, not to be served. So we're on the same mission as Jesus. We're not supposed to be being served. We're supposed to serve. So we're in service of God, and we are giving our lives to serve the kingdom of heaven. So when it says Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many, we give our lives to God, but our God, I mean, our lives are not ransoms. Like we, we don't pay the ransom that Jesus did, but we still give our lives to him and we die to ourselves to serve God and his kingdom. So we're servants, we're dying to ourselves, we are trying to manifest God's name to people so we can glorify God. And in Luke 19.10, says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So we are seeking the lost to bring them to the Savior. That's also our mission on earth. We are seeking the lost to bring him. It's important to note that we are serving on the same mission as Jesus, but we are not saving people. We're not the ones saving people. Christ is saving people. We're just telling them about the Savior, and God does all the spiritual work. He does the heavy lifting. He just uses us as messengers. So the purpose of the church here on earth is ultimately missional. The reason that God leaves us here on earth is to tell other people he uses us as means to spread the gospel, the good news about his son Jesus. So our mission is to make God's glorious name known to the lost people so that they can learn about Jesus and what he's done and how they can be saved. So we, we have this mission. We're telling people about God. That's, that's like as simple as we can put it, right? We're on the same mission as Jesus to tell people about God what are our means and our tactics that we can accomplish this mission with? That's important. And actually, we can see those, we can see four things we can do in John 17 here to use as our tactics and our means to accomplish this mission. So let's look first at verse 21 of chapter 17. It says, That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. So we spoke about this um, in one of our other weeks here about our unity, like the supernatural bond between Christians that we need to show to the world so that we can let the world see that love. And here, just in verse 21, we see that people will believe because of that. Here, I'll read it again. Um, that the world may believe that you have sent me. So they're, they're seeing this love that we have, and that's going to bring people to Christ. That's one of our tactics, is our unity and our love among Christians. It's otherworldly. It is a supernatural love that other people don't have in the world. So when they see that, they're like, I want a piece of that. I want to follow that. What are you guys doing? And that gives us the opportunity to tell them about Christ. Um, earlier in, in John's Gospel, in 1335, it says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So we need this love. 
And this love is even as strong as the Father's love for Christ. We see that in verse 21. Like their bond, that love that they have with each other, this triune God that shares the same essence and they're one in their, in their being there, we, we somehow are just as unified here on earth amongst ourselves. And we need that supernatural love to show forth for the world so that they can come and join us and join the kingdom and be saved and have their sins forgiven. The only way we're going to do that is showing that love for, to people. So we need to be careful of our witness and make, we can, people will come to believe through our love for one another. So we do need to be concerned for it. And people believed and followed Jesus because of his great love. So that's important. We're on the same mission, but using Jesus' tactics. Like, he loved his disciples. He loved everyone he went and saw. And people followed him and loved him because they saw what he was doing for people. They saw the love and they followed Jesus. And Jesus tells us, yeah, if you guys do that too, they're going to follow me in the same way. So again, we're working for Jesus' cause. And he loved us enough to die on a cross for us. There's no greater love than this, right? So we need to show that love to our brothers and sisters so that the world can join us in our cause. So the next point is from verse 20. If you guys want to read that with me. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So their word, that means the disciples' word. Their, people are believing through their word. They're going out and telling people about Jesus and believing in Jesus. So the second point here is we need to share the gospel. We need to be out sharing the gospel for people with people because people believe through that. Just like they believe through the disciples' words and just like Jesus came to earth and told people about God. So we're on the same mission as Jesus. He was telling people about the kingdom of heaven. He sends his disciples to go tell people about Jesus. That's what we're doing. People believe through the words that we, we tell them. We tell them the gospel. When sharing that with them, that's how we need to be going out and proclaiming all the unsaved people need to hear to believe. That's a really important point. People actually need to hear the gospel to be saved. They won't just be saved, you know, sitting under a tree meditating or something, or just like listening to gospel music. You actually need to hear the gospel from someone to be able to believe. We get that from Romans 10, 14 through 17. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how are they to hear some and how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. <clears throat> so let's go back to verse 14 we're seeing of this Romans passage that I'm reading. Um, it's Romans 10. How are they to believe in him who they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So they actually need to hear the gospel to believe. And in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So we actually need to tell people for them to believe, for them to come to Christ. And we saw that in verse 6, right? Jesus manifesting the name of God. He's telling people about God and letting his name be known, telling them about the kingdom, and that's how people come to believe. The people don't just come to believe on their own. So we actually need to go out and tell them. So Jesus spent all his time on earth telling people about the kingdom of heaven, and we need to do the same. We need to tell them that Jesus died for their sins and that he rose again. And we need to tell them he's alive. We need to tell them about how glorious he is. This is our purpose on earth. So we need to be unified. We need to share the gospel with people. And then if you look at verse 8, we'll get our third point here. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and that they have believed that you sent me. So Jesus used scripture when he was speaking, but he also just had God's words because he is God. And that, what we need to know is that we need to use scripture when we're sharing the gospel because that is how we can give them the words of God. Jesus had the words of God. He was God. He is God. And that is something we need to draw from this is people were coming to believe through the words that Jesus got from the Father. And we have the words of the Father. We have the words of the Son. We have Holy Spirit-inspired scripture in our hands. We need to use that as a tool when we're evangelizing people. They need to hear 
about Jesus to be saved, right? And when we're sharing the gospel, we might as well use our most powerful tool, the Bible. Jesus had the words of life, and we just did a series about how valuable Scripture is. Hopefully all you guys remember that. And we talked about how it impacted our lives. So many of you said you were just on fire for the word. You're feeling its power. Why not use that power? Why not use the power that you found in the Bible, that you experienced yourself, right? When you either, when you came to Christ or just in searching the scriptures, after you came to Christ, you can experience the power of the word. And why not use that power? Why rely on your own power and your own wording when you're trying to share the gospel with someone? You are just trying to like convince them of something when you have words of power that you can use. And why try to create some message on your own or some way to say it on your own when it's here? Like you might as well just use scripture because you're not going to say it any better than God. So we know from Hebrews 4.12 that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word is alive, and it'll pierce people differently than your words can. It's more powerful than your words, and this is what you need to be using. It's easy to avoid using scripture when you're sharing the gospel because you kind of just want to riff on your own, but, and it's kind of hard to do because you need to have thought about it. You need to have those scriptures on hand to be able to share. So you guys, it's not easy, but it is the right way to, to share the gospel is to have scripture at hand. It is more powerful. You've experienced it for yourselves. It shouldn't just be in your ideas, although it should be in your ideas when you're sharing scripture, but it should also be like direct quotes if you can, right? You don't have to quote it verse by verse. You don't need to be like, you know, Romans, this, that. Like you can just say what the, what the scripture is if you don't remember the exact verse. Like it's good to have the verse for accountability for yourself and so you can show them in scripture. But if you can just remember it, that's also great. So make sure that um, when you're sharing the gospel that your words are seasoned with salt. Like we, we want our words to have the power that is in scripture. So that's our third point. We need to share scripture. We also remember we need to share the gospel. We need to be unified. The last thing we'll find in verse 17 and 19. <clears throat> Sanctify them in truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified in truth. So we need to be sanctified. This idea of sanctification means set apart. Set apart for holy use specifically. So things can be sanctified, people can be sanctified, but we need to be sanctified here. That's what Christ is saying sanctify them, talking about his disciples, but remember that's us too in the future, sanctify them in truth, your word is truth. So that's the means by which we're sanctified is God's word, right? We're just talking about how powerful it is in sharing the gospel, but God's word also sanctifies us. That means, right, it sets us apart. So this means that when you're in service of God and when we're on the mission that Christ is on, the same mission, right? Even as Christ is on this mission, we're on this mission for God on earth. But for us, we need to be constantly in God's word and constantly being changed by God's word so that we can preach this gospel and so that we can be sanctified. Because if we're being changed by God's word, we're going to be different than the world. And if we're also in God's word all the time, we'll be able to offhandedly quote it. I mean, that's just a byproduct of you read it all the time. It's going to come to mind when you're thinking about a certain topic or when you're trying to share the gospel with someone, if you've been reading scripture all the time, you spend a lot of time doing that, it'll just come up naturally because that's what you spend most of your time doing. It doesn't necessarily have to be most of your time, but if you spend a lot of time doing it, it'll be good for you. So we need to be in scripture to be set apart, to be sanctified. Jesus says that God's word is, is truth and we need to be sanctified in truth. So we also need to be sanctified so that our witness and our conduct lines up with what we're preaching. When we're telling people about this gospel and who Jesus Christ is and how it's changed us, we need to be sanctified by God's word and changed by it and set apart by it so that when we're telling them about this, they can see that in our lives and we're not hypocrites and phonies, right? Because that's actually damaging to God's reputation here on earth. If you say you're a Christian, but you act a different way. You need to be sanctified by God's word and convicted by it and actually be changed by it. So um, these are the tools we have. These are the four tools, right? 
we have, we need to be unified, we need to be sharing the gospel, we need to share the gospel with God's word, and we need to be changed and sanctified by God's word so we can be set apart. And it's kind of like a multi-tool. If you think about it, these tools are all connected to one another. We're going out on the mission of Christ, sharing the gospel, and we need to use the word to share the gospel, but we need to have been in the word to be set apart by the word. And once we're set apart and sanctified by God's word, then we're going to be unified with each other because we're going to grow and be changed and love one another. So they're all really connected to one another. And um, this is really what it means to be on mission for God's kingdom. It means that we're doing all these things and we're on mission even as Christ was in the same way that he was on mission. We're going to be on mission. This is our supernatural connection is that we're going to, in the same way Jesus was, use these tools, right? Jesus was perfectly sanctified. He was as other and as set apart as possible because he is God. Jesus knows scripture better than anyone, and he quoted it often to the Pharisees. Um, Jesus preached and shared the gospel. It's a, he came to earth, and he just went around telling people about the kingdom of God constantly. And that's really what we need to be doing. If we really believe who Jesus is, and we really are thinking like God came to earth and he, he was sacrificed for our sins and we've been forgiven and we have this eternal life. We need to be going and telling people about that because that's incredible. We don't just keep that to ourselves. It's not like religion's not a personal matter, right? You're just like, oh, like this is me and Jesus. Like you need to go and tell people about it if you really know who Jesus is. And that'll make us unified with each other if we really know who Christ is and we're really being sanctified by scripture, then will be sanct or unified like Christ was. He had perfect love and he saw and recognized um, everyone, loved everyone. His other people saw that when they saw Jesus interact with all the sinners, with the disciples, with the Pharisees even. Jesus had love for everyone. So let's look back at verses 16 through 19. Um, we have this mission and we're sent into the world, but what does it mean to be in the world, but not of the world, right? So verses 16 through 19, here with me. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So there's these four verses here and the send sent into the world John 17:18 is sandwiched in between two verses about being sanctified which we just talked about as being set apart for holy use and then preceded by this verse 16 about what um, about being otherworldly so it's kind of our call to missions is sandwiched in there but it's important in this context of all these other verses because our sanctification and our holiness is necessary for effective missions. We spoke about this last week, about being otherworldly, but let's recall what it means to be otherworldly, specifically in the context of missions here. So we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. That means we're not in a commune, holed up, hiding somewhere, you know, not in engaging with the world at all, but it also means we're not identical to everyone else in the world. We're not indulging in the same passions. We don't have the same priorities. We're supposed to be distinct from the world, but also engaging with the world. So if we're the same as the world, we don't have anything to give them. We don't have anything to offer them. And that's why Christ said in verse 14 that the world will hate us because we're different and we're otherworldly. Um, let me read that for you. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Um, as I was preparing, one commentator said that the world demands conformity to his practices and its viewpoints and when you go against it, they hate you. And that's true. People hate the way Christians think. They hate what we are doing. When you know, we're sitting here together, we're thinking like, why do people hate the mission of Christ? Like we're trying to give them the best thing in the world, but the world loves its sin. So they hate us because we're so different, because we're otherworldly, they hate that. So when we're going out into the world, we have many calls in the Bible to be otherworldly, to be different. In 1 Peter 2.11, we're supposed to be sojourners and exiles. In Philippians 3.20 and Ephesians 2, we're, we're these citizens of heaven, like Jesus was, right? And we're going down, we're being sojourners and exiles. It means we're like wandering in a strange land. And 2 Corinthians 5.20, we're ambassadors for Christ. So we're on behalf of 
Christ, right? We're going into the world to speak for him and tell the world about him. That's like when an ambassador from a foreign country does. They like represent uh, another country in uh, a strange land. So we're sojourning, we're citizens of heaven, representing heaven, representing Christ on earth. And in 2 Timothy 2.4, we're also soldiers that are not supposed to be concerned with civilian pursuits. So this idea, we're supposed to be, I mean, basically like aliens. Like we're coming from a different planet to earth and we are representing a different cause, a different place, heaven, and we're, our mission here is right to tell people about the gospel. We're on Christ's mission. So we shouldn't be concerned with civilian pursuits. We shouldn't be concerned with what's popular or what to wear or whatever drama's going on because like, if an alien came to earth, they wouldn't be caught up in arguments over you know, sports teams or uh, The Bachelor or um, I don't know, politics or something. So we need to be as on mission as someone from another country, right? Just coming as an ambassador for Christ, like we're not concerned with what the world is doing. We're on our mission to share the gospel with people. We're supposed to be so otherworldly that we're always on mission just like Christ was because we're on the same mission as him even as he was sent, right? So we're supposed to be on this earth serving as Jesus was and he wasn't wasting his time in the greater politics of Israel or the Roman Empire or something like that. He was not worried about the things that were happening in the world as much as he was worried about saving people and going to the cross and paying for our sins. So this is how our otherworldliness and sanctification shows up in our lives. We're supposed to be ambassadors in the world who are on mission for the kingdom of heaven at all times. It's supposed to be like, that's the focus of our lives. And if someone asks you why you're here, you'd say, I'm here to serve Jesus Christ and I'm here to go and share the gospel. Like that's, that's really why you're here, to bring people to God so that they can know God. So this mission, this idea of missions is usually talked about in, in, in the idea of like foreign missions, right? Like I'm sure a lot of you think of missions as going to another country, to a church and, and serving there. Um, it's very normal, especially in America, I think, for people to have that conception of what missions are. So a lot of people think we're going to these other churches to serve, and that's like the mission, right? But we're called to help the poorer churches across the world. I mean, the churches in the Acts and the New Testament were helping each other and supporting one another, and we are supposed to do that, but it's really not the mission that we're here for. It's to tell the world about Jesus Christ and to bring them to God. So our mission on, in the world is not, it's not necessarily to go to another country and just serve at that church, right, and uh, build houses or support those churches. That is a function of the church, and that is what we're supposed to do, but that's really not being on the mission, right? We, missions go to unreached people groups, people who haven't heard of God. And there's still a lot of people that have not heard the good news of Jesus on this earth. Um, when we go out and we share, we're, we're ushering in the new heaven and new earth and serving Christ and sharing the gospel. So we've talked about going on missions to other countries and these like foreign missions. We, um, we had a message about it a few weeks back when we were talking about God's word and how people don't even have the Bible. So a lot of you guys were super fired up about that. That's awesome. It that was really cool to see how many people were interested in doing foreign missions to unreached people groups. That is so cool. We, like, I really want to encourage you guys to do that and really just send it, go for it, change the path of your life, go serve Christ in that way. We need more people to do that. But today I'm going to speak about missions a little bit differently because we already have talked about that very recently. Um, I just want to talk about the fact that you, you don't need to be in another country to be on mission for Christ. Um, we need bold evangelism here in our own neighborhoods. So, I mean, there's only a few of you guys here, but who has shared the gospel ever in your life? That's awesome. Good. That's great numbers. Um, so with this idea of going a new place to share the gospel, you don't have to raise your hands, but who's, just think to yourself, have you shared the gospel since you came to Cal Poly or came to San Luis Obispo to do whatever you're doing here? A lot of people have this idea that you need to go somewhere to share the gospel. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people, especially in our larger group, have come to Cal Poly and have not shared the gospel, right? So there's a big percentage of people who come to Cal Poly and are like thinking about school, right? And that's why you're here to do. Like, 
ultimately your life has some other aim, right? But you're here to just like get school done and move along. Understandable, right? That's, I mean, that's like what you go to college for. But really, you've come to this new place and you should be thinking about sharing the gospel with people. You shouldn't go through college and be okay with the fact that you never shared the gospel. And I, it, a lot of you guys have shared the gospel, and I don't know if it was at Cal Poly, but that's great. And you guys need to continue to share the gospel, and we need to be in that together, sharing the gospel wherever we go. You're sent on this mission, and um, there's a student, Noah DeVico. Some of you guys um, knew him here. He was a student we had a few months ago, and he died recently, but at his funeral, his father shared this, such an inspirational quote, something that I just aspire to be like. He said about going to Cal Poly, I'm here to win souls for Christ. And if I get an education too, that would be cool. So that's crazy. I mean, his idea of going to Christ was this, or going to Cal Poly was this mission for Christ. He was thinking, I'm just gonna go, you know, share the gospel. I'm gonna go serve in a church. Like immediately, as soon as he showed up here, he was serving. And he's thinking like, if I get an education while I'm at Cal Poly and in slow, that'd be chill too. Like his whole mission really was Christ's mission. And um, that's the mindset we need. We need to always be on mission. Something uh, Chris said the other night, Chris Cotting, he said, there's no days off and there's no transition periods, especially for Christians. There's no like, oh, after college, I'll start serving in church or start being on mission. Um, after I leave my own town, then I'll, I'll start being on mission for people or for Christ. Like, that, there's no days off, there's no transition, like you're always on mission. That is the purpose of you on earth, is to share the gospel with people, to bring them to the glory of Christ. It, like our whole lives are about Jesus, that's why we're here. So when we share the gospel, it's really easy to kind of share the gospel. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you have kind of shared the gospel with someone. I know I have, I've like half shared it, or maybe I've heard it put, like, put a rock in their shoe, or you mention christian things in front of them, or you mention that you go to church in front of them, or maybe you even invite them to church, or you're sh like, I've heard it like sharing by your witness, like you're, you know, you were good, maybe you didn't drink in front of them or something, which is, these are good things, right? We've all done these things, and I wanna encourage you to, to, at the very least, keep doing these things, but we're called to something greater than that. Um, just don't think that by half sharing or by sharing by just your witness that you're actually going to be doing God's work and be on the mission to save those people because you have to share the gospel like we read in Romans 10, right? They have to hear the gospel to be able to be saved, right? Like it's not just like being around Christians. They don't just get saved by osmosis. Like just by being in close proximity to you, they're not gonna be saved that way. So it's not being on mission. We actually have to, share the gospel with them and you know use these principles right they they can see the unity and the love that we have and they could like if they are around us enough then our love for them will turn into us sharing the gospel with them so they'll see our unity we're going to be sharing the gospel with them we're going to be sharing god's word with them and they'll see how different we are so all those things together is how we're going to share the gospel with them not just one alone and like you just need to all those things together, all the tools we have need to be used to help people and bring them to Christ. So, you know, don't leave any of those tools out of your tool belt. So just ask yourself, I know you guys have a lot of friends that you're probably around and you wanna share with. Are you making God known to them? Are they seeing your unity? Are you sharing the gospel with scripture with them? And can they tell that you're different, that you're sanctified, that you're set apart, right? That you're not of the world. Just ask yourself those things. And I wanna tell you this because there's a lot of organizations or people that will tell you that it's okay to go this soft, like churches will say this, and organizations that are Christian will say this, like you become friends first, right? Or you need to ask permission to share the gospel with someone, um, or you need to respect or even affirm their beliefs, like, yeah, like, I hear what you're saying, you know, like, I agree with some of that. You, you really want to be careful with that because Jesus doesn't let people get away with thinking their beliefs are true. Like he was telling the Pharisees like they're straight up wrong about things. Like the people that like know all about it, he's like, no, you're, you're wrong. You're wrong about that, straight up. So we can have the boldness because we're on the same mission as Jesus to tell people they're wrong when they're saying something wrong about the supernatural world or about reality and, and the universe, right? The, I had a, 
a moment the other night where I was sharing the gospel with this guy, with uh, my brother David, and we're, we're sharing, and he's telling me about like his blessings, and he's like, yeah, like I get all these blessings when I do good stuff, but when I do bad stuff, like Satan gets me, you know, like, you know, you just gotta be, you gotta do good to be blessed, right? And I was like, actually, no. Like, no, that's not how it works. Like, you're maybe like, he's some sort of karma with like God's like lingo used or something. He was just wrong, but it was, it was awkward to be like, no. Like, I just, no, <laughs> like, you're not right. So it's awkward. Uh, there's a tension there of, like, telling someone they're wrong, especially when they think they're right. There's some, like, spiritual friend, and they're just telling you about something, and you're like, ugh, like, no. Like, I, I also had this other friend, Michael, I was, when I was in the religious studies department, and he was telling me, he's, I think he was, like, Buddhist or something, and he was telling me about, like, uh, the universe or, like, the ultimate reality or, like, like the, the greatest being or something, and we're kind of like talking past each other because he would sometimes even use God. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, God, God. But I, I was kind of shy about like telling him like, no, like it's not just like the ultimate reality or, or something. Like I, I don't really know what you mean by that, but it's, it's like Yahweh. It's Jesus Christ. Like that's, that's what we're talking about. So it's easy to kind of miss people if you're just kind of affirming their beliefs or telling them they're like, yeah, yeah, like you're right, but I'm also right. Like, no, you're saying contradictory things that are like exclusive claims. So you need to, you need to tell people that they're wrong sometimes and, and that's hard to do and it can be awkward. So you need to share your beliefs and people think it's, it can be narrow-minded to like force your beliefs onto someone, right? Or like to, to tell them that they are wrong and you're right. Um, it's not narrow-minded because it's the truth. And if you have the truth and someone was denying it, like, they're like, there's a train coming. You're on the train tracks. And they're like, they're like nah, there's no train. You're like, I can see it, dude. The train's coming, right? Like, that's, it's on its way, and you're going to get hit if you don't get off the tracks. That's like the truth and reality. And maybe you'd be forcing your belief on them to tell them, no, you're wrong. There is a train. But there's still a train coming either way. So you know the truth, and it might be awkward. It might be that tension. But you need to help them and share the gospel with them and tell them the truth about God, tell them the truth about reality so that they can um, come to know Christ. So it, you don't want to offend people, right? Like, I get that. Um, and you don't need to be purposely provocative, and you don't need to try to be offensive because the gospel is really offensive in itself. So you're going to offend people. Like, the gospel is offensive. You're going to offend them either way because you're going to tell them uh, they're sinful and that they deserve God's wrath. And no one likes to hear that. So it's going to be really hard to hear that, and it's going to offend them either way. So you don't need to be purposely provocative, but the gospel is offensive, and you got to know that. So Jesus and Paul, um, they they don't like back off from this, right? And I think these like ideas about wanting to be gentle um, are meant well by you know people that think that, and we're actually supposed to be gentle and respectful in First Peter three fifteen, like when we're making a defense of our faith, we are supposed to do it with gentleness and respect, right? But also with conviction and boldness. Like how many times was boldness mentioned in Acts? A bunch of you guys were mentioning that when we're doing the New Testament in seven, like we need to be bold. Paul and the apostles constantly pray for boldness and they were very bold to the point that Paul was being stoned and thrown out of cities and um, he was really letting the offensiveness of the gospel fly because these people hated hearing what he had to say, but he didn't let them just get away believing the wrong thing because he actually loved them and he actually wanted to tell them about that. So um, we, we should think about like what is success in our mission, right? We're on this mission for Christ, the same mission that Christ is on. We need to tell people about God. We need to bring them to know God. We have these tools we're talking about, right? We got to tell them about the gospel. We got to start with that. We got to use scripture. They got to see that we're unified. They got to see that we're set apart and we're sanctified. But what is success in a moment that we share the gospel? It's not necessarily conversion. It's not necessarily that they just see the light and immediately are changed in that moment. Believe that that can happen and that it will happen, and those things happen all the time, but it's not necessarily your success because not everyone on earth is going to be saved. So that's not necessarily your success. It's not just saying Jesus or it's not winning a debate or an argument with someone. It's not like having the philosophical position that beats theirs. Um, our success when we're out and on God's mission, trying to get them to know God, is sharing the gospel. We need to fully share the gospel. That's the success, right? That they hear the gospel and that we use scripture to tell them. And it's important 
to remember, though, that we can't just leave it at sharing the gospel, right? Especially if they are interested and they do have questions about us, like get their number to call them back, right? Or uh, try to bring them to church. Like these are good things that we need to do to try to bring those people to Christ because just sharing the gospel isn't God's whole plan, right? Like we need to share the gospel. We need to tell these people to follow Christ. But once they're like, oh, like Christ, tell me about him. We don't just like, ah, I share the gospel. Like my work here is done. You just walk away. Like, no, you need to actually bring them in, bring them to church, teach them about the things of God. Our, our mission is really clearly put in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's the Great Commission. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus says we need to make disciples because part of his mission was he was telling people about the kingdom of God, but he was making disciples. He had people following him and he was teaching them things, right? He's like, the things that I have commanded you. And he wants us to go and teach other people about them so that they can observe them. So we need to make disciples and we need to baptize them, right? And teach them about the things of God. It's not just sharing the gospel. We need to go and make disciples. So, um, yeah, it's not just about half sharing or <laughs> like just letting them know about Jesus. We need to give them the gospel and then make them disciples so that they can go make other disciples and tell other people, right? That's how the word eventually came to us. That's how the good news came to us. Jesus made disciples. They told people. And like Second Timothy 2, 2, like they entrusted it to faithful men who entrusted it to faithful men. Like it goes down and it spreads, right? This is like butterfly effect. It came from Jesus. And now there's millions of Christians everywhere all over the world. So our motivation behind um, sharing and making disciples is our love for Christ, right? It's not like we're going to get into heaven because we have shared the gospel enough times. We don't have a quota or something. That's not the reason we're going to share. It's because Christ died for us, because he loves us. He first loved us, so we want to love him and walk in obedience and serve him and be part of his mission because he's our everything now. It's because we love Christ that we're doing these things. We're not just loving or we're not just going out to like get it done so that God will love us or so that we can, you know, fulfill like the quota, the criteria to get into heaven. It's not what we're about. The gospel is all about grace and it's un unmerited favor. So I'm just going to finish here by sharing the gospel with you guys um, just, uh, just real quick. So the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of our Lord and Savior starts with our problem. And the problem is that um, we're sinners and we need this good news of Jesus Christ because we are sinners and we are headed for death. And what makes the good news so gloriously good is that we are spiritually dead, like without Christ, we're spiritually dead. We read in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everyone has sin. And we read in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. So everyone has sin, the wages of sin is death. We're all dead, spiritually. We're spiritually dead and we're headed for destruction. So this means that what we deserve is death. We've all sinned and we're gonna receive God's wrath at judgment unless we have Christ. So that's, that's like the bad news, but the good news is that we can have Christ and the rest of Romans 6.23 is all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we can't earn salvation. It's completely undeserved. It's freely given to those who believe. If, if we want to have eternal life, we just need to believe in the name of Jesus. There's nothing we can do. It's all grace. It's all the grace of God. We can't earn it. We can't do anything to change God's mind. It's just unmerited favor. We all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So we can have this eternal life by believing in Jesus. We can go from the spiritual death because of our sin to eternal life if we trust in Jesus and we repent and he will forgive us for our sins because he went to the cross for us. Jesus went to the cross, he died for our sins, all of our sins are nailed up there with him. It's our sin that put him there. He had to die, he was the perfect sacrifice. He's paid for all sins for all time, all your past sins, all your sin right now, all the sin in the future. Jesus has paid for our sin and now there's no condemnation left for us. We read in Romans 8.1, 
and now therefore there's no condemnations for those who are in Jesus Christ. So we can be in Jesus, we can be adopted as sons because God's approved of his sacrifice on the cross. He rose again. Jesus is alive. He's alive right now and he's with us and he's given us the Holy Spirit that's in us. And you can be a part of this. You can know Jesus and have all your sins forgiven and you can avoid God's wrath if you just trust in Jesus' name and come to know his love and enter into the grace that God has for us. Jesus says in Matthew that we, had to be, we have to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven. And if we know Jesus and we trust in Jesus, he will give us his righteousness so that he lived the perfect life on earth. And we will have that basically so that when God looks at us, he'll see Jesus' perfect life and not all your sin, all the sin that you've had in your life because Jesus has paid for it. So we get Christ's righteousness so we can be eternally alive with God in heaven in his kingdom, so we can come to know the Father through Christ and have this eternal life. So believe in Jesus and have your sins forgiven and spend eternity with Christ. All right, guys, I'm going to pray for us and then we'll continue with some worship. Lord God, I pray that these people tonight are blessed by this message, that your people hear your word, Lord, and that they, they know it's true. They know that we need to serve you. We need to change our lives, all of us. We need to stop being concerned with the world, Lord, and just change our lives to share your gospel with people. And Lord, I pray that we can be united and sanctified by your words so that when we do share this gospel, it has the power that you intend for it, Lord, and that we speak through your word. Thank you for giving us your word, Lord, that we can just look to it for our guidance and these truths within it. Lord, we love you, and we're so grateful for the grace of Jesus Christ, the love that you've shown us that really just surpasses all of our understanding. We can't even love, understand the love that you have for us, Lord, and just the love that Jesus Christ would die on the cross for us, Lord. I pray that we go and share this truth with others, that we tell them about the, the free gift of God, that they can come to know Jesus Christ and have this eternal joy and fulfillment in their lives and serve in this way, Lord. So I pray this tonight that everyone knows the gospel here and that anyone who doesn't would come to find Christ and seek him, Lord. So I pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So there's a uh, yeah, discussion question. Sorry, I forgot about that. A couple discussion questions next. Uh, you guys can just like turn to your neighbors and we'll talk about those real quick. Thanks.
All right, guys, finish those thoughts real quick. All right, guys, if you could start turning your chairs around here. Uh, we're going to stand and worship one more time as we wrap up the night.
before you oh there we go wow hot mic um thanks for being here tonight and suffering through the cold if you didn't hear me say that but um next week we're going to finish up this series um pastor ben collins from our five cities campus is going to come preach for us i'm super stoked for that um and then we'll be moving on to some other stuff that you'll hear about next week remember virtual game night sunday if you want in the zoom code will be in the email this week so just check that and that's how you'll know where to go um just a heads up for me personally if i'd like disappear all of a sudden it's because we had our baby so so, um, yeah, hasn't happened yet. Um, due date is next Wednesday. So, but I don't know anything about this, but apparently it can be any time. So we'll see. Um, so if I'm like not here for three weeks, don't be like, he quit. Um, 
I just am trying to be a good dad and husband. So that's uh, kind of stuff that's on the horizon. Um, if you're new, maybe you're new tonight. My name is Darren. I'm the college pastor here at Grace Central Coast. I'd love to meet you before you leave. So say hi to me. Um, thanks, John, for preaching for us tonight and praying that that'll be a reality for us, you guys, that we feel like we're sent out into the world, even as Jesus was. Um, it takes courage and prayer, but um, let's strive together to do that. So thanks for being here. And until next week, ready, break. Break.